Now, some people find it difficult to believe that the transatlantic slave trade or the trans-Saharan slave trade actually took place. That is why we are here today in Baragui again, to show the world, to show those who didn't believe. Unfortunately, it is not the beginning of the African story, but it is part of the African story. My name is Anago James Akin Osho, and where we are is a barracoon. A barracoon is a slave house, or a slave cell, or a slave store. And in a room here, they kept 40 human beings in a room. And there are more than 40 rooms in this compound. Imagine how many human beings that died or perished in this compound. Across the shores of West Africa, there are so many slave dwellings. Now, a lot of us don't even know that there's a, that Lekki is a very, very important slave port on the coast of West Africa. We are in Baragui, very, very important. Every community, every village have a slave story to tell. But if those communities don't tell their story, nobody will tell it for them. We need to take care of these monuments. All the monuments we have, they are our past, they are our present, and they are our future. A lot of things took place, and we must document them. Because history is for us to learn from, so that we don't continue to make the same old mistakes. When we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, or we talk about the trans-Saharan slave trade, there are still traces of where our ancestors were kept. That is the essence of a barracoon. The way those slaves were kept, to me, are more important than the chains. Because where they are kept shows us, proof to us that the slave trade actually took place. Where we are is the Brazilian barracoon of Siriki Williams Abbas. One of the irony of Siriki Abbas was that he was a slave who also became a slave trader. His first owner was an Islamic scholar known as Abbas. Abbas. So they call him Abbas. Abbas, the slave trader in Dahomey, sold him to an European by the name of William. So they call him Williams. That's why today they call him Williams Abbas, because a slave don't have a name. His real name was Fare Mileku. His father's name was Fagbe Me. He himself was captured at a very young age. So many black people came back from the diaspora and they changed their name from their slave name to their original name. And some of them took on African names because they believe that those names were actually not their name. And it's true. You see, that is another evidence that the transatlantic slave trade took place. Seike Abbas, when he was sold to William in Brazil, Mr. William did not resell him. He noticed there was something unusual about him. Instead of reselling him, he took him to his, his, his house and made him a domestic slave. Domestic slaves work in the master's house. Plantation slaves work on the farm. The man treated him well. He taught him how to read. He taught him how to write. Through Mr. Williams and the friends of Mr. Williams, this man learned how to speak many languages. English, Dutch, Portuguese and Spanish. And it really helped him. As a young man, his owner, Mr. Williams, met him and said, I want to give you your freedom, but I want to have an agreement with you. You work for me. And he responded by saying, sir, I'm your slave. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. And Mr. Williams decided that instead of him coming to West Africa, he needed people to represent him here. And he sent Siriki. Williams Abbas back. So that was how he became involved. And when Mr. Williams sent other Europeans to him, because he could speak many European languages, it helped him. And all the chiefs in the interland also want to do business with him. In the year 1895, eventually, this man called Siriki Williams Abbas was made the paramount ruler of Padagui. Now, he ruled this town from 1895 till his death in 1919. This was Siriki Williams Abbas court when he was the paramount ruler of Badaigo. Over there, there's an inner chamber, and this was his court. This was where he passed his judgment on all the villages and towns that were under Badaigo at that time. People would come from as far 
as the interland from places like Ilaro, and Sekia Bars will be the one to judge them here in his court. Now, this was where Siriki Williams Abbas, or Balakri, was buried. None of his contemporaries that time had a mausoleum like this, built for them. Maybe we'll go inside and you see what the interior looks like. We are in the mausoleum of Siriki Williams Abbas where he was buried. And when you look around this mausoleum, look at the design. Here it was built for him. It was, it was his Brazilian friends who actually built this place for him. We are not singing his praises. History and the history of Sirikia Bars, I am using him as a point of contact to appreciate the gift of freedom because the transatlantic slave trade, the trans sahara slave trade, actually took place. And this man, called Sirikia William Sabas, was one of the actors. You're welcome into the barracoon. And this is a man called Sirikia William Sabas. He became very, very vibrant. He became very, very important. How did he get the name Sirikia? We know he got the name Williams and Abbas. In this town, when he got here, he dominated everywhere. How was he able to dominate? It was because he could read. He learned how to read and write through his master in Brazil. And don't forget that it was illegal at that time for you to teach your slave how to read and write. He learned how to speak many languages. So all those characteristics helped him in this town. He was using his position to promote Islam. So the Muslim community gave him the title Seriki Musulumi of Badaigri. He also became the head of the Muslims in this town. But because of his love for Islam, he adopted the name Seriki as his own name. Now, in 1895, when the British made him the ruler of this town, that was when this picture was taken. And this was the umbrella given to Seriki William Sebas. The value of an umbrella, unfortunately, was 40 human beings. How did we come about the umbrella? What is so special about the umbrella? It was fashionable in medieval Europe to see ladies move around with umbrella. So they sold that idea to the chiefs around here. They tried to make them feel that they are more important than their people. So they need something to differentiate them from this, their subjects, from the people in the community. This umbrella was given to Sir K. Williams about in exchange for 40 human beings. Now, where we are standing, the first room in the back room of Sir K. Abbas was referred to as the inspection room. When they come to pick the slaves, here they inspect them. They inspect the eyes, the dentition, they hit them in the stomach to be sure they are strong enough to work on the plantation. When we get to the inner room, you see what the little window looks like. Imagine 40 human beings in a room. Imagine the suffocation. Imagine how many of our ancestors have perished in this place. Now, I'm sweating already, and I've not been here for, uh, for one minute. Up there behind me is that little window where the only opening for ventilation to come in here, okay, is nine feet by nine. Around here, we have some items they were using in exchange for our ancestors, okay? The value of a ceramic bowl here in Badagri that time was 10 human beings. It's part of the sad history that we have. And we, there are five of such places. Here. So the five we have here represent 50 human beings. I can't imagine how many plates were broken. Just think about that. And some people don't know the Germans were also involved in the business. The Germans were involved, but to be sincere, they were among the first set of people who don't want to be associated with the business. But you see, this team one were given to Sir King William Sabas by his German friends. His Brazilian friends presented him this. It's called the brass dish. And the value of a bottle of gin in Badagri was 10 in And this are some of Sir Kabas money. We actually dug this from this compound. The man was a big man. Okay, like we say in Lagos, he was a big man, affluent, wealthy, rich, and of course, he got taste. Look at those gramophone records over there, okay? He actually used these gramophone records. 
This was the same cloth, the exact cloth Sir K. William Sabas wore in 1895 when the British made him the paramount ruler of Badagu. These are remnants of his chariot. He was so prosperous that he has a chariot, you know, a horse pulling a wagon. Okay, so we could say that time he was the only one who holds a car in this town. Now, around here are some of the slaving instruments, and there's one here they were used for children. Now, children were also taken away. And people say, okay, those children, how were they given birth to in the barracks? You no. Know, some of these women they were captured in the interland. Some of them were pregnant when they were captured and they gave birth in the barrack room. You know our mothers, being who they are, some of them have their children on their back when they were captured, maybe in the farm, on the farm. Our mothers won't let go of their children. So anywhere you take them to, they go with their children because children were also enslaved. They said, when the opiates came, the narrative was that we were selling each other. It is much more than that. I have a friend, he's of Jamaican origin, and some of them don't like Africans. They say we sold them. But no, it's not. They taught them that day. Unfortunately, on the coast of West Africa, we are teaching the same narratives here. It's not, that was not what happened. Were we so dumb that we we're just going into the communities and taking each other? We'll talk about that when we get to the point of no return. To enjoy more of this, our Ogunke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.